Aren't you thankful that God holds our head up? Do you ever feel like in life that you feel like you just can't hang on or hold on, that you feel like you're drowning, you have nowhere to turn? But thank God he holds our head up. I don't know about you, but that, that's the way life must have felt for this prodigal son. And um, last week, if you're here for Father's Day, we looked at the prodigal's father. And we looked at this prodigal son who had, um, and, and Luke, we were in the book of Luke last week, we're going to be back this week in Luke chapter 15. And we had the prodigal son. Now what's happened is this prodigal son has come to his father and he comes to his dad. He goes, Dad, I want my portion of everything. Because I want to go off and I want to live my life and enjoy life right now the way that it is. So what happens is this prodigal son, he takes all the money that his father gets, gives him. Now this goes against every custom, everything in the Jewish faith. But the father says, you know what, son? I'm not going to hold anything back from you. This is your choice. Now, I want you to understand something in life. God gives everyone in here choice. Now, I want you to stop and think about this. Now, there are some circumstances in life that are just life. Sometimes you're going to go through stuff in life and it's just life. Guess what? Bad things happen. When sin came into the world, the fall of the world came. And you've got to forgive me, I'm ADD and these chairs are out of line. There's sin in the world and some things in life just happen. Guess what? Sometimes you're just going to get a flat tire because you ran over a nail. It wasn't because Satan's trying to destroy your day. Sometimes life just happens. And it's not the worst thing in the world. It's called life. But then there's sometimes in life that we go through circumstances that we place ourselves in because of choices we make. Now this prodigal son came to the father and, and the father says, you know what, if this is what you want, son, I'm going to give it to you. We can go to God the father and say, God, I'm going to do this. And God can look at us and say, hey, that's not a wise choice. But we can still make that choice because we have free will. Now this prodigal son, he goes and it says, he takes everything that the father gave him and it says he went off to a far country. He got as far away from the father as he can so he can live life the way he wanted to. Now I want you to understand something. We do the same thing. When we choose a life of sin, when we choose to go down a path that we know is absolutely wrong, you know what we do? We get as far away from the father as we can. Well, I'm not going to that church group because I don't like that person over there. Or I, I, I don't want to hear that sermon because uh, we've heard something similar to that before. And so what happens is we find everything we can to distance ourselves away from the Word of God. We don't want to hear truth. This young man has gone as far away from the Father as he can to a distant area, the Scripture says. While he's there, he spends all of his money, and then guess what? Life happens. Famine came. Something he didn't expect. All of a sudden, this young man finds himself absolutely broke with nothing. Not only did he lose all of his money, but all of his friends that came along with the money. Have you ever had friends like that? As long as you have something, you have friends, but if you don't have it anymore, you don't have those friends. All of his friends are now gone. And it said he had absolutely nothing, so he hired himself out to feed pigs. Now, if you know anything about the Jewish faith, they have nothing to do with pigs. To, to them, pigs are the lowest of the low, the nastiest of the nasty. And I agree with them. Pigs are nasty animals, but I do like bacon. Can I get an amen? amen? Okay, some of you guys woke up. Pigs are absolutely nasty. I talked to you guys about it last week, how my grandmother used to have that slop bucket, and she would make us slop the hogs. We would have to go out and have to feed hogs, and it was nasty. I mean, we, we were kids, we used to dare my cousin to jump on the back of the pig and see if he could ride the pig, and, you know, he fell in, and it was great stuff. My wife's actually in nursery today, so I can tell you the story I didn't tell you last week. We had put a, we had put a, 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 a fence around our pigs to keep them in, and we had to electrify that fence. And I'm going to tell you something. Uh, when you're little boys and you're growing up on a farm, you do all kinds of crazy stuff. And so we dared my cousin, he couldn't stand on one side, pee on the other side. Being from the city, it could, took him a couple times to realize what was going on. Some of you guys will catch on to that later. Those pigs were the nastiest things in the world. 
And it says this young man was in such deep sin. He was in the filth of the world, literally. It said he began to long to eat the food that the pigs were eating because he had nothing. And it said as he was in the filth of his pigs, as he was at the lowest point in his life, It said he came back to a census that he heard the Holy Spirit speak to him. He said, I'll go back home to my father and tell him, Father, I've sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven. I recognize I'm in sin. He goes, you know what? I'm not worthy to even be called your son. He goes, I'm not asking for anything special. He said, but can I come home to just be a servant? Because I, I recognize that in my father's house, the servants had plenty to eat. In my father's house, he took care of everyone. And it didn't matter where you stood at. My father was good to all of his servants. He was good to all of his people. And he said, I'm not coming home to even ask if I, I can be a son again. But I just want to come home that I may be a servant. I don't want to live where I'm at. And I love the scripture. We talked about it last week as the father standing out on the horizon. He sees off in the distance. He sees his son coming across the horizon. And the scripture says, the father begins to run to the son. It says, as a matter of fact, it says, he pulled up his robe to run, which broke every custom. He was showing those legs off that he had, Mike Pittman. And all of a sudden, he begins to run to the son. He embraces the son and he, he calls his service there. He goes, hey, we're, we're going to have a party. My, my son's home. He said, I want you to place a robe on him. Give him a signet ring. Put sandals on his feet. Every one of those we talked about last week, the robe which we talked about the resemblance of authority. We talked about the signet ring and the purpose of authority that it meant. We talked about putting sandals on his feet. Hey, you're not a slave. You're a son is what he said. He said, I've restored you back to your place and position. And we talked about the last week how the father loved the son. Could you imagine if your son was gone for a long time? You had no contact. And he came home and said, I love you and I missed you. Any good loving father is going to wrap his arms around his boy and say, I love you, son. And that's the way that this father treated this son. And that's the way that God the father looks at us. He goes, hey, my son who was dead is now alive. And so we see how the Father's love was given towards this Son. But there's a part in this scripture right here that you never hear pastors preach on. And it's the older brother. Today I want us to stop and look at the older brother this morning for just a moment. You see, last week we talked about that loving Father. But today I want us to look at an unforgiving brother. If you have your Bibles in Luke, Chapter 15, I'm again reading in verses 28. Luke chapter 15, verse 28. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So the father went out and pleading with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slating for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat that I can celebrate with my friends. But when your son, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. And I love this father's loving response once again. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You see, I want you to understand something about the older brother first of all this morning. The older brother became angry, the scripture said, and refused to come in. How many times has somebody came to us and said, you know what, would you forgive me? And we had anger in our heart. We refused to listen to him. I, I want to tell you something right now. This older brother had a major heart issue. You see, he wanted to be forgiven. He wanted everything that the father had for him, but yet he was unwilling 
to forgive his younger brother. You see, he had a heart issue going on here saying, you know what, God? I want all of what you have for me, God, but I'm not willing to give you any of me. You see, he looked at this younger brother and he had no compassion. He had no love whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the scripture goes on and says the father went out and he pleaded with him and he said, hey, please come into the house. And I want you to notice what he does. He rejects the father right here. It says he refused to come in. And what happens in our life, I want to tell you something. When we're sitting in a service like this, and all of a sudden we're preaching about forgiveness, and we're hearing about forgiveness and loving other people, and all of a sudden God the Father says, hey, there's something in your life right now. And all of a sudden he brings somebody to our mind, and we say, well, God, I'm not going to deal with that right now, God. You know all the issues. What we're doing is we're quenching the Holy Spirit. We're saying, God, no, I'm not coming in that door right now. God, I'm not ready to forgive them. God, I'm not willing to forgive them. God, you don't know how much they hurt me. God, you should know what they did to me. God, I've done everything to make this right, and they're still unwilling to make it right, God. I'm not going to forget them, God. I'm going to wear my badge of honor that says I have the right to be hurt. And that's exactly what that older brother was doing. He wasn't rejecting just a younger brother. I want you to understand this, church. He was rejecting the father. He wasn't just saying to the younger brother, I don't want to be around you. But, oh, dad, I'm not coming in. You might forgive him, but I'm not going to forgive him, and I'm not forgiving you neither. That's exactly what he was saying to the father. You see, when we have this... This, this anger in our hearts. And we have this rejection in our hearts. We're not just saying, I don't forgive you, but God, I'm willing, unwilling to be forgiven this way. Scripture is very plain and it's very clear to us. It says, you know what? If you will not forgive your brother here on earth, God the Father will not forgive us in heaven. And right here, as we look at this passage of Scripture, I'm going to tell you what. This young man right here is literally rejecting the Holy Spirit. When we're sitting in a church service and, and, and that person is brought to our mind or that group of people or that situation is brought to our mind, I'm going to tell you something this morning. That is the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Saying you've got an issue in your heart. This older brother said, Dad, I'm not coming in. I don't want anything to do with him. And as a matter of fact, he goes on, he begins to even accuse the father. Saying, hey, I've been here with you all this time. Look at, what he, look at how he answered him. He answered, he goes, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. He said, dad, all this time I've been coming to church. God, all these years I've been serving in this church. They never threw a party for me. God, all these years I've been in this church and what award did they give me? You ever had that attitude? God, I've been serving here for 20 years. They never threw me a party. But all of a sudden, this guy who came here 15 years ago walks back into the church and comes to an altar and everybody's excited and they're praying over him. We ever throw ourselves those pity parties? You see, this older brother has sat in here and he goes, look at all these things that what? I've done. It's all about me. You see, I want you to understand something. You may have been attending church for a long time, but it doesn't mean you belong. You say, oh, Pastor, what do you mean everybody belongs to the church? You know what the church is? The people. The church is not the building. You may be coming to church for a long time, but your heart's way away from it. This older brother was there at the home, but his heart was far from the home. His heart had nothing to do with the father. I'm going to tell you something. You can have a lot of religion, but no relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of the most intelligent people I talk to want to sit down and talk to me about religion and theology, but they know nothing about Jesus. 
I said that I had a conversation with a man one day, and I know I made him mad, and to be honest with you, I really didn't care. There's a thing called being righteously indignant, righteous anger. He wanted to sit down and talk to me about theology and talk to me about all the different things that the church does wrong. And he had every answer uh, of why the church, and I'm talking the church, I'm talking the church universal should or shouldn't be doing this or that or the other. And I finally looked at him and said, you don't know Jesus at all. He said, what do you mean? I said, you have no relationship. I said, not once have I heard a loving word, but only critical words and criticizing. Every other church, every other denomination in the world. I said, I never once have heard you say anything about love. I said, as a matter of fact, I said, you know a lot about the Bible, but you don't know the Bible at all. Because you have no relationship with Jesus. I said, your theology really doesn't impress me. As I sat down and talked with him, I said, you know, I can have a conversation with you. I have a master's degree in religion. I said, but having a master's degree in religion means nothing. But having a relationship with Jesus Christ means everything. You see, we can know all we want to about the church. We can know all the things that the church does and, and understand all the things about the church. We can come in here every single Sunday. We can know every word to amazing grace, which I don't because I'm not a music person. We can quote Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. But if we don't apply the Bible to our life, it's useless knowledge. When we begin to apply Scripture to our life, then it becomes wisdom. It becomes the Word of God is alive in me and is beginning to change me. This older brother was there with the Father all the time. He knew how much the Father loved him. He knew how much the Father loved the younger brother, yet he did not even know the Father at all. Because if he would have known the Father, he would have known that his dad was a loving man, that his dad was a forgiving man, that his dad was right there for him. He goes, son, don't you know that everything I have here is yours? Now stop and think about this for just a moment. What would have happened if when that younger brother came across that horizon that day, that it wasn't the dad out there that saw him first. Just think for a moment if the younger brother, the older brother would have been there. Imagine if it would have been the older brother who would have saw his younger brother coming across that hillside. And who would have met him out there. Could you imagine the conversation then? What are you doing here? Oh, you're back again? Dad doesn't want you here. You've wasted everything. Look at you. You're filthy and dirty. You don't have shoes on your feet. You smell like, you, you smell like manure. It's the last time you took a bath. You're filthy. You're not worthy to be in our home. You're not good enough. You see, that's what the enemy tells us. You're not worthy. You're not good enough. Your life reeks. You don't have it together. And the enemy's constantly pushing us away. So why don't you just go back to where you came from? But you see, it's God the Father who's so different. You see, everything changes when we come in contact with the Father. You see, in this morning, in this service, we have to understand something. We can either be the older brother, or we can be like God the Father. You see, as a church, everyone does belong. You know why? Because the church opens his arms wide and says, you know what, come in. We want to embrace you because we love you. You don't belong because of who you are, but because of what God's done for you. You see, I want you to understand something. This is what happens when we come to the Father. Number one in your outline, first of all, is the word redemption. You see, I want you to understand the word redemption. The word redemption comes from the word redeem, which is a financial term. We talk about this every year when we, when we go through a, a stewardship series, and we talk about the importance of stewardship. When we look at the word redemption, it literally means to be bought back. Do you realize that you were bought back with a price? 
It cost the father a lot to bring the son back in. Now, I want you to stop and think about this from a Christian standpoint for just a moment and what it means that we were redeemed. To understand what restoration is and the power of restoration we're going to be talking about this morning, we have to first understand what it means to be redeemed. There's only one person who could redeem us from our sin. Now, I want you to understand this, what redemption is. If we're to be bought back, there's only one price that could be paid. It was a price that none of us could ever pay. As a matter of fact, it was a price that the angels couldn't pay. It was a price that nothing created could pay. A lot of people will come to church, they say, you know what, Pastor, I just want to really get involved in church. I want to give back to the church. I want to help out in the church. You know, I, I've done a lot of bad things, and I, I, want, I want my life to mean for, count for something, and, and I've got to give back. And that's great, that's important, because I'm going to tell you what, if you're a member in the church, you should have a job. Every person should have a job. We'll talk about that tonight in our Connect class. If you join the church, guess what? You're expected to work in the church. Everybody is. That's how the church runs. But when we look at redemption, guess what? You cannot earn your salvation. I don't care how much work you do in the church. I don't care how much money you give to the church. I don't care what you do for the community. You cannot earn salvation. I don't care how good of a person you are. You can commit the rest of your life to humanitarian works, and guess what? You're still lost. Because sin eternally had separated us from Jesus Christ. And there was only one way to get back to him. You see, in the, in the Old Testament, we had the sacrificial system. Every time that a sin was committed, they would have to go, they would have to slaughter an animal, they would have to give a sacrifice. I don't know about you, but I thank God we're not in a sacrificial system anymore. Do you realize the sacrificial system that you had to sacrifice for sins that you didn't even know you committed? You had to sacrifice for sins that somebody else thought that you committed that you didn't even commit? You're talking about getting messed up. These people are always sacrificing something. And guess what? As soon as they sacrificed an animal, the animal was still wasn't perfect. The animal still had blemish. And there was never a perfect sacrifice. They tried everything they could do, but then all of a sudden, Scripture tells us that Jesus came. God Himself in the flesh. And He willingly went to that cross. And I, I want you to understand something. He paid a price for you. He redeemed you. He bought you back from death to life. Now, I've heard many people talk about Jesus when he went to the garden. And he went to the garden and he began to pray. And it said it, he was at the point of almost death. I want you to understand that. He had such grave concern and his heart was so heavy. It was literally to the point of death. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, Jesus went there and he was praying that he knew the torture he was going to go through. He knew all the pain that he was going to go through. I, I, I've got news for you. I struggle with that a lot in my life going, you know, why was Jesus to the point of death and so concerned, but yet Peter was crucified upside down? Why did John allow himself to be boiled alive? Were, were, they, were they more faithful than Jesus? I don't tell you the answer is no. You know why Jesus was so overwhelmed and had so much concern? He, didn't re he recognized there was going to be pain on the cross, but he also knew that the weight of the world of sin was getting ready to be placed upon him. That every sin throughout all of humanity, he was going to take to the cross, and he recognized for one short time and period in history that God the Father, the only time ever, was going to have to turn his back upon the Son because he could not look at the sin, and Jesus at that one time and point in history was totally in darkness, separated from the Father. Your sin, my sin, every sin ever created, every sin ever committed, went to the cross with Jesus, and he said, you know what? I am dying for you. It wasn't the nails that held him there. It wasn't the pain that he took. Literally, Jesus died. When you look at the cross and you go back, Jesus did not die on the cross of asphyxiation like everybody else did. Uh, did. As a matter of fact, if you go back and you look at the cross, 
Historically, if you look at the cross, if you go back and you look scientifically at the cross, it says they took the spear, they ran it through his rib, it came through his rib, it punctured his heart, and water came out before blood. Literally meaning that Jesus died because his heart had exploded. That's why the Romans couldn't understand why he died so quickly. Jesus literally died. I'm going to tell you something, church. He died because he had a broken heart for us. That he loved us so much that he really went there. And because he went, he paid a price that we could never pay. I'm going to tell you something. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful to God that he paid a price that I couldn't pay. Because without Jesus Christ, there is no redemption. Amen. Because Jesus Christ, I can be saved. It doesn't matter what I've done. I came, I'm going to tell you what, you know how I came to God? I came like that younger brother. Just like each and every one of you came. We were dirty and filthy in our sin. We were undeserving. Because the Holy Spirit came to us and said, hey, come back to your senses, boy. Why are you running from the Father who loves you? And when the Holy Spirit spoke to us and whatever service, or maybe somebody was witnessing to you, or however you came to Jesus. And you came to your senses and you realized, God, without you, I'm nothing. God, I'm lost and I don't even know what direction I'm heading. God, I'm broken. And I can't be fixed by myself. As the Holy Spirit spoke to our hearts and we said, Jesus, I need you. That those loving arms of the Father, just like he did with that younger son. He wrapped his arms of love around us and said, you know what, son? Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. And Jesus Christ literally redeemed us from hell. He bought us back with a price that we could never pay. Do you understand there's a lost and dying world out here that needs to be bought back? That person in the checkout line who's giving you a hard time? That boss who simply seems like he's just an absolute jerk? Those crazy teenagers with all the different color hair at Walmart at night running around driving you crazy? You've all been there to the scary Walmart after midnight. I know you have. Don't act like you're more spiritual than everybody else. Oh, we had to go to the ghetto Walmart last week. You've all been there. And what we're doing is we're looking at people going, oh, pastor, they're different. Oh, they are different. Let's not lie about it. They need Jesus. They're just like you used to be. Sometimes I'll find myself in Walmart and I'll be behind some of those quote-unquote scary people. And I say, you know, I've got to pray for them. We realize that, you know, there's a lot of lost people that need to be redeemed. Instead of us being like the older brother looking at them going, man, you've messed up. There's some messed up people over here. Guess what? We live in a messed up world with messed up people that need a Savior who can redeem them. And see, we're going to be one of two people. We're going to be that older brother that looks at him and goes, man, they're jacked up. Those people are crazy. Or we can look at them and say, you know what? They need compassion. They need love. They need somebody to show them that there's hope. They need somebody to wrap their arms of love around them and say, you know what? God loves you and I love you. They need somebody to be honest enough to say, you know what? I've stood where you've stood. I thought I had it all together, but I didn't. I was in the bottom of the depths And God brought me back. We begin to understand that God loved me so much, He redeemed me. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians 1, 7, it says, In Him we have redemption, listen to this, through His blood, 
We're only redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I'm going to tell you what, no other religion, nowhere else in the world can anybody be saved other than the name of Jesus. He is the only one who raised from the dead. He claims, I am the way, the truth, the life. Listen to this. No one comes to the Father but through me. Through the blood, we are redeemed. And listen, the Scripture says after this, through the blood, the forgiveness, because of the blood of Christ, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that God says, hey, I'm rich and I'm abundant in forgiveness and love. That I'm constantly forgiving you. I'm constantly loving you. I'm never, ever, ever going to give up on you. If you're a parent here and you have a child and you're a good parent, I recognize there's bad parents in this world. But if you're a good parent and you understand what love is and you love your children, you realize, you know what? Children can be in the pain in the butt sometimes. Let's be honest. We've had teenagers. If you hadn't had teenagers yet, you're going to have them at some point. If not, you've probably been around them. They're not always easy, right, Hayden? Amen. Your mom said amen. I have one, too. He's sitting over there on the other side of you. You actually have one on the way, too. One's going to turn 13. They're not always easy. But any good parent will lay down their life for their kid. There's nothing they wouldn't do for their child. When their child hurts, they hurt. Mike and I, we've had this conversation. There's nothing you wouldn't do for your boy. I'd give anything for him. Any good parent's going to look at their child and say, you know what? God, if you're going to take anybody, take me. Don't take my kid. <laughs> God's love's always that way. It says, accordance with the riches of God's grace. That God never, ever gives up on us. He's constantly loving us. What brings us to the second part, number two, is restoration. And this is what I love about God. He doesn't hold our past against us. You see, the older brother was full of resentment. He was full of rage. He wanted revenge. He was pretty rash in his judgment. He was the exact opposite. You see, some of the most miserable people in this world are the older brother. They come and they sit in the church each week and they hear about God's grace and His love. Yet they still have resentment in their hearts. And what they try to do is they justify everything they do. I wouldn't be like this if they wouldn't like that. And they're always looking and saying, you know what, well, that Lowell over there, I'm not as bad as he is. And I'm a little bit better than Barry, but not quite as good as Debbie. So I've got some room I can grow. And what happens is we try to justify our lifestyle, and we try to justify the way that we act. We react instead of responding with God's love. And so what happens is, is we try to justify our life and our lifestyle compared to somebody else who we say, well, they're a Christian. And if they act like that, then I must be okay. But I'm going to tell you something. If you really want to look at who you are and you really want to do a self-examination, look at yourself compared to Jesus. Because you don't know somebody else's heart condition. You can't sit there and look at them and say this or say that. You can sit there and say, Jesus, look at me. Because I'm going to tell you what, when I start feeling really good about myself, say, so you know what, hey, I'm a pretty good person. I'm better than Logan over here. Well, maybe. Depends on what day it is. And all of a sudden, so I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Say, so, hey, I must be doing okay. Then I get into God's Word, and I'll read Oswald Chambers. and goes, man, I feel like the worst person in the world. Because, God, as you begin to search my heart, you reveal who I really am. God, as you begin to search my heart, you show me all the dark places. God, as I look at you in your holiness and your righteousness, as Isaiah looked up in Isaiah chapter 6, and holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. All of a sudden, God, when my eyes are focused on you and not my neighbor, when my eyes are focused on you and not somebody else, 
All of a sudden, God, when I see you and your holiness, I begin to realize, God, without you, I'm a ruined man. But God, it's by your grace that you choose to restore me. God, it's by your grace that you take me from my old image and you begin to make me more and more like you. And God, every time when I believe that I've arrived, God, and, and I begin to think good about myself, God, I realize, God, how humble I need to be, God, because I'm so far away from where you're at. That God, that your desire is to make me more and more like you. It's like Tim said, I watch those HDTV shows. And I love to see those old houses that are torn down. They're beat up. Full of junk. And the first thing they do is they begin to clean out the junk. And then they begin to restore that house. They begin to move walls and expand territories. New things are added in. I like the old Mustangs. I've got an old 66 Mustang, and I absolutely love it. To see an old car that was once junk be totally restored. To put back to its glory what it used to be. But, and not only what it used to be, but a lot of them, they go back to even greater things. Because guess what? Older cars didn't have power steering, a lot of them. They didn't have air conditioning. They had drum brakes, and they didn't have disc brakes. And all of a sudden, they're made to be something better than what even they used to be. And you know what God wants to do to you? He goes, I want to make you something much greater than you thought was even imagined or possible. God goes, I've got so many great things for your life. It's not who you used to be. He goes, I don't see that younger son walking across the horizon who's dirty, who doesn't have a robe, who doesn't have a ring, who doesn't have sandals on his feet. He goes, I see my boy coming across. And he said, I see a robe on him because I'm calling for the robe before he gets here. He said, I see shoes on his feet. That means that he's made to walk and carry the gospel that he's a son. I'm putting the ring on his finger saying, that's my child right there. He belongs to the family. The signet ring had a marking on it that he could take and he could dip in ink and he could take it and he could seal it and say, you know what, I'm part of this family. We're walking across the horizon and God's calling us to him. And all of a sudden we start coming to him. That God looks at us and goes, I see my son. I see somebody who's redeemed. I see somebody I want to restore. He said, I see the great things that I called you to do. I don't see the old junk. You take a car in here and a guy to restore. He doesn't look at the junk and the rust and the dirt. He says, you know what? I see what this is going to look like. Woo! Could you imagine? I, I, I couldn't contain myself. I could see what God really saw me the way that he sees me. Could you imagine if you could see yourself? Could you imagine just for a moment if you could catch a glimpse of what God really had for your life if we were to get out of the way? Jabez prayed, God, expand my territory. God, I want to do more and more for you. Number three, after the restoration's renewal. Scripture says we're to renew our minds. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I love this scripture verse. It says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, listen to this, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. You know what true worship is? Living for Jesus Christ. It's not coming in here and singing a praise song. It's not get excited when we hear a favorite song because we did a hymn we hadn't done for 20 years and we get excited because that used to be our hymn. And we get blessed. We raise that, Woo, God, they finally sang my song. That's not worship. You know what worship is? Offering our bodies is living sacrifices. God, no matter what's going on, God, I choose to live for you. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I want you to understand something. If you want to be transformed, you must have your mind renewed. You know how our minds are renewed? There's only one way that we renew our minds. It's through God. It's through being in His Word, allowing His Word to penetrate our minds 
but not only our minds, but our hearts, and allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, and we begin to pray, and we begin to say, God, I, I, I want you to make your word alive to me, God. I want your word to live inside of me, God. God, I want to live for you. He goes, then, now, now listen to this. We cannot understand the will of God until our minds renewed. I want you to understand what Scripture says. Let's make it real clear this morning what Scripture says. It says, then you will be able to test and approve God's will. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Once our minds are renewed and we have the mind of Christ, not my mind. The God I'm not thinking with my wisdom. God, I'm not thinking with my resources. God, I'm not thinking with my abilities. But I'm now thinking with the mind of Christ saying, God, this is what you want me to do. God, I'm going to do it. God, you want me to forgive that person? I'm going to forgive that person. And I, I want you to understand, so I preached a message probably about a year ago on what real forgiveness is all about. Okay? Forgiveness is not saying if somebody hurts you really bad, somebody did something horrible to you, you're not saying that it's okay. You're just simply saying, God, I'm not the one to judge you are. God, I'm taking it off my hook and I'm placing it on you. You're the correct judge. Restoration and forgiveness are two different things. Restoration means a restoring of the relationship. God desires to restore relationship with us and to renew us. But I'm going to tell you something. Until we have the mind of Christ, we cannot understand His will. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. First, we have to understand I've got to be redeemed. I've got to have Christ's forgiveness. God, once I'm redeemed, God, you choose to restore me and make me into who you want me to be, God, and then you want to renew me. You want to renew my heart and you want to renew my mind, God, that I may think like you, that I may act like you. I love 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, therefore, if anyone in is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Now, I want you to stop and think about that this morning. Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed. Now, I want you to understand this. This is what the world tries to do to you. This is what the enemy tries to do to you. This is what Satan tries to attack you with. Remember what you did you used to do this. You're no better than they are. You're not righteous. You're not holy. Why are you thinking that way? That's what the enemy tries to do. You know what Christ says? When I came into you, I redeemed you. I renewed you. You were totally changed. You are a new creation. I don't know about you, but that excites me this morning. That you know what? Even though that I'm a new creation, the enemy tries to attack me, I have to remind him something. I'm a child of the king. God has forgiven me. God has redeemed me. I'm no longer that person. Because what's going to happen is, as you start living for Christ, the enemy's not going to be happy. He's going to try to bring up your past. He's going to try to bring up heartaches. And he's going to try to bring up headaches and everything that he can to try to pull you back. But you remind that enemy this morning, I want to tell you something. I'm a new creation of the king. Thank God the father met the younger brother first. And he forgave him and restored him. But I'm going to tell you something, I guarantee you this. It wasn't long after being in that house that the older brother cornered that younger brother at some point. And I'm sure that older brother had a lot to tell that younger brother. You know why? Because his heart was distant from God. You see, the younger brother may have went a long ways away physically, but spiritually, that older brother had been just as far away from the father. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're that younger brother this morning, and that older brother tries to corner you, you remind him that the father's forgiven me. The Father has restored me. And then this is what I challenge you to do is to pray for that older brother. And say, you know what? I know what it is to have loss. I know what it is to be in sin. But I also know what it is to be forgiven. 
And my prayer is that even being the younger brother, we would be like the father and look at that older brother and say, I still love you. I hope you can forgive me. Because you see, as a church, if we can't forgive anybody, we can't be forgiven. You see, this morning, I don't know how you walked in here this morning. Maybe you walked in here this morning and you say, you know what, Pastor, I've kind of felt like that older brother. I felt like I've done all these things. And God hasn't noticed me. I want you to know that's a lie straight from the pits of hell. Maybe you walked in here this morning and you said, you know what, Pastor, I can identify with that younger brother. I've allowed myself to be distanced from the home. I tried living life the way that I wanted to live life, and I'm just miserable. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're saying, you know what, my desire is just to be more like the Father. I don't know where you're at in your life, but you're in one of these three places. You're loving like the Father, you're resentful like the older brother, or you're seeking like the younger brother, saying, Father, forgive me. I don't know which one of these three places you are in your life, but I want to tell you this. God's desire is to redeem all of us, to restore us to his image, and to renew our minds that we may be more and more like him. This morning, as I told you earlier, the Holy Spirit had already spoke to the older brother. As a matter of fact, God the Father said that the older brother became angry and refused to go in that he had a heart issue. Then when the Father came and pleaded with him that he rejected the Holy Spirit. And we reject the Holy Spirit, our heart just becomes harder. And this morning, you've sat in here at some point in this service, and God spoke to you in some kind of way. My challenge to you is this morning, don't reject the Holy Spirit. It's not just hurting somebody else, it's killing you. When God speaks, will you be obedient?